All right. Uh, it's uh, Tuesday, May 26, 2020. Uh, call the Capital Planning Committee to order. Uh, I'm just going to read our short statement. Pursuing to Governor Baker's March 12, 2020, order suspending certain provisions of the Open Meeting Law, General Law, Chapter 30A, Section 18, and the Governor's March 15, 2020, order imposing strict limitation on the number of people that may gather in one place. This meeting, the South Borough Capital Planning Committee will be conducted via remote participation to the greatest extent possible. Specific information in the general guidelines for remote participation by members of the public and or parties with a right and or requirement to attend this meeting can be found on the Town of South Borough's website at www.southboroughtown.com. For this meeting, members of the public who wish to watch or participate in the meeting may do so in the following manner by finding the meeting at www.southboroughtown.com slash remote meetings. No in-person attendance and members of the public will be permitted, but every effort will be made to ensure that the public can adequately access the proceedings in real time via technological means. In the event that we're unable to do so, despite best efforts, we will post on South Coast website as an audio or video recording transcript or other comprehensive record of proceedings as soon as possible after the meeting. All right. Um, we'll go right to approval of meeting minutes from May 11th, 2020. I had two minor edits, Jeff. Sure. Um, one was the spelling of Mr. Boland's last name. It's B-O-L-L-A-N-D. B-O-L-L-A-N-D, okay. And then the uh, second was, let me find it again. <clears throat> There was a there was a sentence where it just it said Mr. Malinowski and then it just there was nothing after it. Um, so I think it might have been just a carryover of um, yeah, it's down at the top of uh, page two. Um, third paragraph where it starts with Mrs. Galligan indicated that this okay. would be Got it. I don't know. Must have been a carryover. Apologies for that. Hey, Jason, I think Bolin is 1L, but I may be wrong. I agree, Kathy. I believe it's right. 1L as well. So we're missing the, the D then, Jeff, too. Okay. Sorry. <laughs> Thank so B-O-L-A-N-D, -L -L got it. Thank you. All right, and then, uh, so Jeff, you just strike that. Uh, are there any other comments, questions? All right, seeing none, I'll move that we approve those meeting minutes with the those two edits. Is there a second? I did. All right, we're gonna do um we're gonna try going in order today. Um so we're gonna go um Lisa, then Hi. Kathy. Oh, sorry. So I'll, I'll I'll just give you the order and then I'll, we can prompt as we go. So it'll be Lisa, then Kathy, then uh Jeff then Joe, then Andrew, and then I'll go at the end. Does that make sense? Let's see. Right. Let's see. Um, so, Brasio? Aye. Cook? Aye. Park? Aye. Palmer? Aye. Path? Aye. And Malinowski is aye. Um, all right, Chairman's update. So I had put on here recap of FY21 budget discussion with Board of Selectmen. Um, they did discuss the budget last week. Uh, it was at least the thought that uh, they may ask for comments on why we had moved certain things around. They didn't. Um, so I don't really have anything else to add on that. I, I do know that the discussions are ongoing um, in terms of uh, budgetary things, but I think they're all on the operational side is my understanding at this point. So. Um, obviously, I think, you know, we'll just kind of wait and see what happens with town meeting date, et cetera, and, and go from there. But um, I think what I wanted to kind of lay out as part of my update is kind of where I, we have a bunch of uh, miscellaneous items today, but where I see us going after this, because I think it'll be important to uh, the discussion of, of how we kind of try to start to wrap some of these together, because we've done a lot of listening. Um, so my intent is at our next meeting, which we can discuss a date on at the end, is to take um, everything we've gathered, try to find the schools at some point post-graduation, get them into the discussion here, 
and actually start to look at where things are falling out on the plan, right? Like we've just listened and said, you know, department head thinks it should fall on any one area uh, or one year or fiscal year. But I think we all know when we actually start to look at a piece of paper, the years aren't going to work up. So start to kind of prioritize where we want to go, where we want to head, both from how it matches up with kind of the five-year levy plan um, how it matches up with five-year potential increases on tax rate, assume, making some general assumptions on what Mark and Brian are carrying in operations, and start to figure out where we really have the issues and where we need to kind of troubleshoot um, accordingly. So um, that's kind of the plan of where I see us going after this, um, once we kind of have all the right data. Uh, but I figured I'd lay that out now because I think it's going to be relevant as we go through a few of these items today. Any questions, comments on that? All right, um, so we're gonna start with fire department. So as all of you saw, and I forwarded you two emails from Chief Achilles. Um, he's given some more thought to his capital plan after coming in front of us. And he had sent in two separate requests um, for various equipment um, for both engine and ambulance. Uh, my personal perspective of these was, um, the engine equipment just seems to be longer term replacement versus one of the ambulance items. Um, and the reason I actually added to the agenda was one of the ambulance gems might be something that pops for the fall town meeting due to a new requirement by the state to, to carry something on the ambulance, uh, which was the IV pump. Um, my thought is that we pencil these into the plan, take no motion of support or no support at this point, but just kind of put them in the plan and then kind of see as we go through the next exercise, where it all falls out. But I don't know that there's anything else we could do. I mean, some of the stuff is nine years out. So I think uh, it would be a little preemptive to talk about it. But I did want to draw everyone's attention to that IV pump. Because again, if the state requires it, they're going to need it to maintain their licensure. Um, the question really is, is whether the, those are capital items or whether those should come out of operating. Or um, Kathy, I guess, if they had throwing this at them with two months notice, whether it would be some sort of reserve item. Um, but given it seems that there's some advanced notice, we should be planning for it um, accordingly to the extent we know about it. Yep. Jason, the other thing I was thinking about with these is, is I don't know if we want to set a precedent that these kinds of things should be ambulance fund. I mean, they're still capital and we should talk about them, but mm -hmm. I think all the equipment that they're talking about for the trucks, anything for the ambulances, that's why we have the ambulance fund. So I think, I, I don't know if there's a, we could just basically blanket statement that, that, you know. We well, I think we took a, I don't know that we actually did a formal motion, but at the prior, at, I think it was two or three meetings ago when we talked about the actual ambulance fund. I think the, the general consensus here was that ambulances, fire trucks, and the equipment related to medical um, would come out of the ambulance fund, but that's all contingent on them actually having enough money in that fund to support right. all of that, depending on how the, the funding worked. I would say where I would differ is where we want to differentiate, at least in my opinion, is on the fire equipment. That should all that probably shouldn't be ambulance fund unless it's full of cash with no other needs. Um, would be kind of how I would differentiate it. Okay. And I think just for everyone's benefit, I think ambulance billing is trending down uh, just due to call volume in the last couple of months. So. Um, I know Brian and Mark were going to get us the latest spreadsheet once they get in. There's obviously delays from insurance and, and the billing company is like, but I think the general trend is down, um, not up. So not exactly the most helpful, but I think we're still in a good spot. So Jason, you believe that we should put the debt service for the fire trucks through that, but not anything else to do with the fire trucks? Is that yeah, I think that's what we had generally talked about. Again, we didn't make a formal motion, but just because... Mark, when we inherited the capital plan and started, Mark and Brian were carrying um, fire protection gear, like uh, turnout gear, uh, self-contained breathing apparatus. Um, they're basically carrying any capital item related to fire in there, but it, it's just not economically feasible. There's not enough money in there. So really trying to differentiate because it was going to really put a lot of pressure on fire's ambulance coming up in terms of they may not be able to purchase it, which is kind of crazy to think that you have an ambulance fund, but not enough in there to fund an ambulance. Yeah, 
Kathy, I was thinking that something similar, I think, along your lines is I maybe would prefer to put the fire truck not in the ambulance fund since it could be excluded debt if we needed it as that and put the rest in the ambulance fund so it doesn't hit the levy capacity if we needed it. Yeah, but of course, excluded debt just means the tax rate goes up. So I, I like it to stay in the cap. <laughs> we'll, we, we'll talk about it, but um, it, it's, it's a discussion. Okay. So, so I think what I'll do on that topic is I'll just put the placeholders in and then when we have kind of what I'll call our working session next time, um, we'll be able to see where there's the issues. And, and I think that, that these are the, the items, right, that we'll want to push um, and say, you know, is this our only lever in these certain years to actually accomplish the capital needs? Um, the second item on fire department was, um, I don't know that anyone would have caught this candidly when Chief Achilles was in front of us, but he did mention um, the self-contained breathing apparatus. They did file a grant last year and were denied. They did file a grant this year, which is currently in process, right? The review period is currently underway. If you get awarded the grant, though, there's a match, a local community match to it that is nowhere in the capital plan. So I asked him how he would fund that. The, the match to get about $250,000 of funding is about $12,000. So I thought it'd be very silly if we weren't able to appropriate the $12,000 to get the $250,000 grant. Absolutely. Um, so the good news is, is these grant cycles take a while to, to work through the process and right, each application is graded uh, by FEMA and we may or may not get it this year, but what I was also going to do with the community's permission was put a placeholder um, for a fall town meeting and then we can decide from there um, for the match. Um, because let's say they don't get it this year, but it could carry to a following year. I'd rather have it there um, so that we're allowed to accept the grant than either have advisory scrambling to find the money or the town looking to deplete the chief's operating budget because uh, this would remove a huge um, item from our capital plan for two years from now. So this is self-contained breathing apparatus grant? Yes. So Jason, if you look at the ambulance fund, is this the same thing? So I'm, I'm looking at it right now to my left. So he's got a line item for breathing apparatus and it has been, it's been taken out, but there's a line item for it. And then underneath yes. it, it says SCBA. Is that not the same thing? Same thing. Okay, so, so I'm gonna get rid of one of them. So he had had it staggered between two fiscal years. One was to make some minor repairs and then th that was like year one. And then year two was for, the actual large purchase, which is about 250,000. Okay. Um, and those those are required. We, we don't have an option. Once they hit 10 years, they gotta go. Okay. Um, so uh, any other questions on that? Mark, Brian, any thoughts on, on that those two potential items come into the fall potentially, but I don't know if there's anything we can do about it. No, I, I, I agree with you, Jason. I don't think there's really much we can do about it at this point, um, but I agree that, you know, we shouldn't um, be short-sighted, make sure we, we you know, uh, put the money in for any grant match for that SCBA. All right, I'm going to move to item five on our agenda, recreation fund. I'm going to bring Tim Davis in here. So Tim, you're now in the meeting. I will just kind of briefly open it up. Um, so I think in our prior conversations, we had talked about how um, we had met with most of the departments, including recreation and um, much like you could just tell in the ambulance fund discussion, even though there are funds that support certain departments, we still have been talking about the capital coming out of those funds. Um, and every fund that I'm aware of that has capital and that goes before town meeting as well, with the exception of this one. Um, so, you know, I had invited Tim, I gave him a preview of the conversation we all had last time and kind of said, hey, we'd like Tim to come in and explain how they're using the money, et cetera. I get, um, we may be in a different time given you know the revenue and expenses going through there, but really try to come up to some sort of joint agreement on, on how we can better collaborate as we work through the recreation fund um, 
moving forward to the extent that any of it will be used on capital items. So Tim, I don't know if you wanna give kind of a brief preview of what you've seen in your almost a year here or um, you know how you wanna go about the discussion, but I'll give you kind of the floor from here. Sure, uh, good morning, everybody. Thanks for having me in again. Um, so the, the rec fund, the revolving fund is, is mainly used for programming. Um, it is our, our money in, money out that we use for after school programs to pay um, to pay the contractors that come in that, that run the programs, to pay the part-time staff that come in to run the programs um, and is also used for our, our main uh, fund for supplies. So whether that be office supplies, um, you know, paper, things of that nature, all the way through to camp supplies and program supplies. And that is the main chunk of really what the, really what the fund is used for um, and has been used for traditionally. Um, with the exception, obviously, that there's been some, at least before my time, there were a couple projects that the revolving fund was used heavily on, um, them being the lights down at Choate and the, um, the, play, the Fayetteville Playground. Um, I think those were unintended. Um, I don't think those were uh, necessary planned to come out of the account, um, but it seems like luckily there, there was enough money there um, to utilize that. Um, but outside of that, um, as I'm sure what might have sparked this was we're, we're replacing the small playground behind, um, behind the townhouse using this fund as it is a small project. I think that traditionally something like that would be a capital project, um, but seeing how, how it is under $20,000, um, but as it does relate to the programming that we at least planned this summer to put forward, um, it was able to come out of the, the REC revolving fund um, as, a, as a small um, investment into, into the little playground there. Um, but, you know, for the, for the most part, you know, we, we have some things that we've been talking about that have, you know, some specific amounts, I think, reserved, hopefully for the future. Um, like you just mentioned, our you know our revenue a revenue stream that was planned to come in took a, a massive hit uh, this month and this summer um, with the cancellation of a lot of our most of our all of our programs in the spring, as well as um, you know summer camp, which is our our biggest our biggest program across the board. Um, but for the most part, you know we we do rely on that really for our day to day business for our for for probably about. 75, 80% of what we do um, is, is out of that revolving account. Um, but I apologize, I don't know if that answered any questions or I, that was a general overview. I'm not sure exactly what you're looking for. No, that, that's a great start. <clears throat> and I see Don's raising his hand too, so I'm gonna bring him in. I don't know if you want to add something. Um, Don, I'm gonna bring you in. Why don't you just quickly introduce yourself for the community members that may not know you. Can you hear me, Jason? Can, go ahead. Great, so my name is Don Dumont. I'm a member of the Recreation Commission. Uh, working, been working with Tim for the last year. I've been on the commission uh, about a year and a half or so. 100% uh, agree with everything Tim just uh, stipulated there. Um, the, we, we, as a member of the commission, getting involved with the Revolving Fund, we pay attention very closely to uh, ensuring that the funds that uh, are deployed from from the revolver are used for programs that support the revolver, those programs that are uh, associated with the revolver in accordance with the regulations there um, that support that. Uh, and that generally speaking has been limited uh, in the time I've been there to very few items that I would consider capital. So I think to mention one of them, and I think you probably would consider the van that we, that we uh, replaced uh, a year or so ago is probably a capital item as well um, that support the transportation of um, participants and equipment in support of those programs uh, as an item there. The one thing that I would add, I believe, is, is that our deployment of uh, funds from the revolver is a portion of the warrant each year. So under the warrant, we have approval to deploy a particular amount. If that amount uh, is exceeded. And generally, it's much in line with what Tim is describing. The amount in the warrant is generally enough to cover um, the program spend for the year. Uh, if our uh, spend were to exceed, and I believe that it happened before my time, but I believe it did go over with that Fayville project that Tim referred to, uh, 
the commissions require, the departments require to go back and seek approval for that spend. So uh, there is a, an element of um, oversight and approval required uh, annually for the spend that comes out of that uh, bucket. That's very helpful. Um, I guess my my only comment or I guess question to, to probably both of you is I get, you know, as given what we've been charged with, which is a very broad um, request, um, there's a lot of time situations we're seeing where again that we've only been together about two months now. Uh, and there's been a lot of situations where we've kind of linked projects together. Right, so instead of one department being out doing one thing that may impact department B, uh, we've been able to link things together. So I guess my only request, and also I'd say there's been numerous opportunities for alternative sources of funding um, that we were able to find even in a short time period. Um, so I guess what my request would be going forward is if you do foresee capital items coming out of recreation that we at least just have an agenda item and talk about it as, as a group. Obviously, even if we aren't supportive, you still have certain powers and authorities that you're granted as a commission. But I think from a transparency perspective, it'll optically look a lot better to how, how the funds are getting spent and two will allow us to kind of weigh in to make sure that there's not something else that should be either piggybacked onto one of your initiatives or likewise, that you shouldn't be piggybacking on to someone else's just to uh, I get, guess get greater economies of scale. Um, that would be my only request if you two were open to it, but I don't know what the rest of the committee. Uh, so I think Jason, that would be, that, that suggest makes a lot of sense to me. I will ask that Tim uh, comment quickly because uh, uh, one of the things that Tim has brought to the table in the last 12 months is his ability to uh, uh, to find money uh, elsewhere. So if you could, Tim, just could you give a little bit, if you already haven't, um, you were able to secure a, a lot of the offsetting funds for that project. So we, I think Jason, he can demonstrate that we're, we're heading in that direction to be able to really pull money wherever we can. Yeah, so, so Don, I'm assuming you're talking about the playground? Yes. Yeah, so the initial, um, you know, the, 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 I guess the, I'll just give you a quick background on the playground. When I came in, um, part of my background is as a, a playground safety inspector. So, so part of the things, one of the main things I did when I first came into position is, you know, looked at the playgrounds, kind of identified some risks and identified kind of the quality and the state in which the playgrounds were in. Um, the townhouse playground being of great concern um, just because of the, the style of the playground it is. Um, so we hired a third party audit just to be sure. Um, and that playground was um, was suggested to be removed right away. So um, this was a project that kind of came abruptly. Um, while you know we we might have known it was coming, at the same time it was it was kind of a situation where it was a safety concern. Um, so we wanted to move on that that project relatively quickly. Um, so so when the commission you know granted permission for us to or for myself to start expending the funds for that, which, which equaled about 20,000 um, for, the, for the full playground. Um, on top of that, you know, we had, we had feelers out with our friends group as well as grants. And in the time since that, we did receive the grant to, a grant to cover you know, our, our, um, the aspect of it for ADA compliance with a, the walkway. So that took $1,100 off and then we're repurposing some money from the friends group um, due to the cancellation of our summer programs. Um, talking with them to to offset that. So just within the last couple of weeks, um, we've gained about <clears throat> looks to be about four to five thousand dollars to take off of that project. Um, and and we're looking obviously continuing to look um, to do more and more. Um, but the the intention was always um, as as a lot of these projects and things that we're doing is you know uh, the approval is great from the commission, but uh, you know as I mentioned before, our revolving count is kind of uh, the crutch in which we stand on it's you know it needs it needs to be healthy really in order for us to to run ourselves efficiently as a as a department um, so finding those alternative funding sources is, is just as important than getting the initial approval from from uh, my, my commission okay any committee members have any other comments questions i do hi don hi tim it's kathy cook um if the 
schools do remote learning for the fall semester, what does that do to your RAP programs in the fall? So we, we're actively discussing that, obviously. Um, you know, we, we do believe that even if the kids do remote learning, we will be at a place as technically we are now that we are able to offer programming on a much smaller scale. So while the programs may not be in the model of an after school program, there, there will be programs out there for, for the kids to take part of, uh, most likely in the afternoon um, at the conclusion of their of their online learning. Um, there would just be most likely smaller programs. And um, my guess is there'll be more just because our numbers are going to be limited. Um, so, so we are planning um, already kind of around that and, and what that would look like. And we're, we're actively talking with the schools and, and they're, keeping us, they're keeping us in the loop on the direction that they're going. And that's even, that's even to say towards the end of the summer, you know, once the more restrictions get lifted, um, you know, we, we do feel pretty comfortable that, you know, come August, we're gonna start be able to, to offering again, smaller scale programs outside. Um, so, so it's really our intention to start up programming. We're looking at probably early to mid August. Um, for just a couple, you know, drop-in programs and then leading into hopefully a more consistent thing come to school to start the school year. So I'm asking specifically about the effect on capital. So as far as the capital that you've already committed to to come out of the revolving fund, which would be, I would think, the playground, possibly mm -hmm. DePetri? Uh, no, DePetri was um, a town meeting funded project completely. Okay, so the overrun. Uh, there should be no, well, knock on wood, so, there so should be you no got, overrun. So the overrun got fixed, right? Correct, yeah, we put it out the bid and we got a lower bid. So the only capital um, commitment you've got right now to come out of the revolving fund would be the playground? That's in process, correct, yes. Okay, so you should have, in other words, you're, the fund's gonna get hit um, one way or another. It's gonna get hit by the summer camp being closed and possibly um, the RAP programs being at least reduced. And so therefore, you may not have a lot of excess for a while to be able to do things, but it sounds like what you've got committed to, you've got covered. Correct, and like I said before, you know, we're in a, we're in a place that's healthy and, you know, even though we did, you know, refund a, a significant amount of money, you know, that's money that we, we you know, obviously didn't spend yet. So we were, <clears throat> excuse me, we're, we're sitting on what we were sitting on, you know, come the end of the, win of the winter, which was, a, which was a healthy amount. So as long as we're not, we're not touching that, my plan is to just carry that over as much as possible so we're not putting ourselves in jeopardy. Okay. Anyone else? All right, so Tim, Don, uh, greatly appreciate you joining. Obviously, um, if anything comes up in, in the near term or, or longer term, we're happy to listen and offer any commentary. But again, don't want to be an impediment to anything, just more try to connect the dots where we can. Yeah, I appreciate that. It's good to see you guys. Thank All you. Right. Thank you both. Have a great day. You too. All right, uh, let me just switch gears here uh, with our panelists and bring Bill in. So Bill Harrington, I've brought you in. Uh, you'll have to unmute yourself, but our next agenda item is presentation from the Council on Aging for Potential Porterville Hall Renovations. So Bill, the floor is yours when you're ready. Unmute you. Are you hearing me? Uh, I just unmuted you, so now I can. Oh, <laughs> good morning again, everybody. Um, uh, thank you for giving me a chance to talk to you about our project. Uh, I, I think you've all seen the packet, which was uh, a lot of it was designed to uh, bring some of you people who may or may not be up to speed on just what happens at the senior center, a little idea of what we do, the uh, programs and activities that we have, and uh, give you an idea of what we need going forward. Um, if you look at any of the projections of population, our town is, is, is eldest population is growing and in the next half a dozen years or so, 
a third of the town's population will be seniors. Uh, we need to address that issue. The town needs to address that issue and, and uh, be ready to help this, this very important part of our population. Um, and what we need right now is an area for people to come in and just generally be able to come in, get out of their homes and relax and have a little social life. Uh, we are the only senior center in this area that doesn't have that uh, particular piece of uh, structure in our senior center. So we're, we're proposing that we uh, have an area, uh, add an area to the front of the building that would give this uh, uh, activity some presence. Right now, if somebody wants to come in and watch TV, they are sitting right in the main thoroughfare from the entrance to the building to go to the function hall. If they wanna come in and sit and read the paper, they're sitting again in the traffic area going from the, from the entrance to the function hall. Uh, it's not a comfortable area. And when, when we have luncheons or anything like that, uh, it, it gets the congestion is just unbelievable. So um, what we would like to do is, is put a bump out on the front of the senior center with a, a room we call a commons area. But anyway, it would be an area that would provide a place where out of the traffic, you can sit, relax, read the newspaper, watch television. You could, there'll be a bookcases that where you could come in and read a book or borrow a book. And, uh, uh, maybe a computer or two, maybe a jigsaw puzzle, but just an area where people can come in, get out of their homes for a while. It's very important that these people uh, have a place to go. Uh, one of the most successful projects we've had is the Doll Men's Club. And we meet for one hour a week. And yet for some people in their lives, that is the most important hour in their life. So you can see just how important the senior center is in the lives of, of uh, our older population. Um, this, the plans for this bump out uh, addition have been already been done. Uh, they were, uh, money was allocated a couple years ago. We have the plans, uh, we have the quote. We, we uh, decided that uh, it's gonna be an expensive project we feel that we can keep the price down for two reasons. We need one, just to keep the price down. And two, we, we, are, uh, we have an, a, uh, um, a cap, ADA cap, that says how much money we can spend on this building uh, based on the appraised value of the building. So we need to keep our, we need to keep our costs within, within that framework as well. Um, we, we've talked to Asabet vocational. They're the, they're the kids that did the, the golf club across the street. Uh, very successful project. Uh, we feel quite confident that the, the, these kids can do this project. They, uh, in talking with the, the, the instructors who, who lead this particular part of the school program, are very enthusiastic about doing this project. It gives them all sorts of valuable information. So we, uh, we have a price from them. They are two years out getting, to, getting ready to uh, get us into the queue. They have a project coming up this, hopefully coming up this fall uh, in, for them in Northbro. So it'd be first opportunity at best to get onto this project would be uh, September of 22, uh, so which is fiscal year 23 when you start getting into the finances of the thing. But anyway, uh, that's, that's where we hope to go with getting this project done. We hope to save the town a lot of money and we hope to give the kids a good opportunity. Um, we also are gonna add a, a bathroom in the rear, which is already, uh, already part of uh, funded by uh, facilities. So that's gonna happen this summer, which will give us an additional bathroom, which is a wonderful, wonderful thing. Um, uh, what else can I tell you? Uh, 
we just we just want to see this project get underway. We we hope that the the capital committee will see that this is a valuable asset and and a, and a real need for this community to get something going for the for the hope help the seniors. Uh, this would be working with Asabet would be what we call the ultimate intergenerational project. Uh, we've got we've got school kids working for the benefit of the seniors, which is you can't beat that. Um, we just think a, a senior center, a good, strong senior center is good fiscally, socially, and economically for our community. And we hope that we can get your support. Um, I'm open to any questions, comments, whatever. That's great, Bill. I just wanted to, to thank you for the effort that you put into, obviously, the preparation, right? It makes our job easier as committee members to kind of know 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 what uh, you're looking for and really you know use this time for questions to answer. I do have some, but I'll kind of defer to others first. I just want to make one clarifying remark. Your bathroom is subject to town meeting approval, I believe. So we need yeah, to have yeah. a town meeting. Yes, um, it is, but it's a, it's a, it's it, and we've supported that as well um, mm -hmm. and supported that move. I just wanted to make sure. Mm -hmm. um, oh, we understand that. That okay. So with that being said, I'll open it up to, to any questions and I'll come back on the back end. Jason, if I may. Go ahead, Lisa. Um, good morning, Bill. How are you? Great, Lisa. Good morning. Um, so I, I can vouch for how much the senior center um, um, means to a lot of people. It's a, lot, it's a lifeline to a lot of people in this town. Um, I, I'm supportive of what they need. I just have a couple questions and I don't know, Bill, if it's you or John Parent. I'm, I'm just looking for my understanding of falling within the cap of the ADA. That's based over a three year period. And I just wonder where we're at as far as, as we sit today over the last three years, what, what has been spent on the senior center just to make sure that we stay within the cap. And that's probably a John Parent question and I see him yeah, let me uh, let me bring John in if he's ready to go. Um, I, I, I can I, I can address that partially in the in the sense that the two two major items that have been done rec recently are the uh, windows in the front of the building replaced, and also the um, uh, oh there was a second oh the chimney chimney repair, and those. Those will probably be off the three-year limit by the time we get onto this project, so we don't think they'll have a bearing on it. John, okay. do you have anything to add to that? Uh, actually, uh, Bill's correct in that statement. If this was truly set up for fiscal of twenty-three, uh, the odds are those would already be off of the three-year book. Um, we have to keep in mind that three years is three years from the project frontward or backwards. So if you do the project, you know, you have to keep that mark in mind for the next three years of when you complete the project as well. Um, that's why when we take this into consideration, we will have to leave some sort of buffer in case, God forbid, something blows up here and we need to replace it and it's a costly repair. So we should take that into consideration. But Bill is correct. As we stand right now, I do not foresee any major issues coming up in the next few years, but again, you never know what's going to happen with the building. You really don't. Okay, so John, you think that this would fall within the the, the buffer window potentially? Just just to be clear, that um, other than the twenty five thousand, you don't see anything else that that may or may not affect this. No, outside of that, you, we should be good right now, from what I can tell. If we if we're looking at fiscal twenty three. Okay, perfect. Thank you, and thank you, Bill. Thank you, Lisa. Thanks. Anyone else? I just wanted to, so Bill, I think when you came to advisory, one of the conversations we had on whether or not if we built a new building uh, for senior center, whether or not a joint building with the rec department would be okay in your eyes. And I, I believe, I don't know where you jump out, but I believe you're okay with that. So I just wanted to confirm that as we're thinking of future plans. Um, two comments on that. One. Uh, I'd like to say that we would love to see a community center, but I see that way down the line. And sometimes people will say, well, why are you spending money now on a building that you, you really want, you want to be out of in, in a few, in many years or 10 years or so. Uh, 
the answer is we need this this now and to spend this money is, is good money and who knows when we'll have a community center which is a major major effort so we would like to see this go ahead but my in my estimation and, and pam lafrancis the, the the director we both feel the council on aging feels that the community center is the right way for the town to go it uh, it's economically very, very feasible. Uh, to, to you people who not, don't know the concept exactly, the, the community center would house not only the senior center, but also recreation and maybe some other portions, departments of the town that relate to, to human services. Uh, so, and it would be a major effort. It would have, it would have uh, gyms, it would have fitness rooms. These items could be used during the day by, by the seniors, during the afternoon, by the youth and so forth. And, and it would have places for adults to, to use in the evening. So it wouldn't be just a daytime facility. It would be a, a full-time, probably 24 seven facility. Uh, so the future, I think, is, is a community center, but that's so far down the pike that what we need is something right now. I got a couple questions, uh, Jason. Richard. So, um, Asabet, if, we're, if we're, they're already coming in, is there any opportunity to have them do all these projects at once so we can maybe save a little bit of money? Um, that's the first question. The second question is, does mm -hmm. that do you, want to take that, do you want me to take that one just quickly? Sure, sure. Um, so my understanding is they can only do certain projects at a time, right? Given they have a number of communities they support. Okay. So I think. It did one one project. I think is what we'd okay. be able to sign up for. Okay. If you look at the golf clubhouse, right? They they put the deck on the front of that, uh, which was phenom <clears throat> phenomenal work. Uh, but it took a decent amount of time, right? Because it's a training exercise for them as well. Got it, uh, Jeff. They they need a bathroom desperately, and now that if the senior center is closed, they can jump in there and get that thing done really quickly. Right. Not asking to delay that project. I'm just asking if they're already coming in, if they could. Actually, actually, the bathroom project is being done by town employees. It is not being done by Asabet. Yeah. Oh, okay. Sorry. Uh, uh, facilities is going to going to do that. Uh, they they will need a little bit of support. Uh, with a plumber or, or electrician, but essentially it's the uh, the uh, framework and so forth. The major part of the construction will be done by facilities staff. Okay. And then the bathroom project, it's not part of the ADA limit? It would be, but it's only $25,000. So it won't, won't have a major bearing on the, on okay. the situation. Yeah, I think last time we calculated it was like 350k of room before we okay. get to that. But yeah. things change. Any other questions? I guess my my only comment, Bill, and it's somewhat along the lines of um, what Andrew had asked, is um, it seems like community centers your longer term, you know, desire, right? So. You know, and we are looking short and long term here as a committee. So, if we magically stumble across a way to accomplish a bunch of things together, it doesn't sound like your your group is opposed to that or wed to it being Porterville Hall. Now, I know there's been engineering done, all of that, right? But if we if we were able to to group some things together here to accomplish what you're looking for, I guess it's now two years down the road. And if it happened not to be Porterville Hall, are we going to have anyone? Kind of yelling and screaming at us that that's not what what you wanted i, I think the, in that situation the only downfall would be um obviously we probably wouldn't be able to use ass of it uh i i i'm not sure what your question is jason so, so we found if we found a different building oh to oh. accomplish oh, okay. both all of your accomplished all of the needs that the council and aging is looking for plus we've heard from recreation Plus, we've heard from some other departments. If we were able to find another building, whether it's in the town's inventory or not now, are you opposed to us going down that road, or are you just looking to get your short-term two, three years having this kind of extra space to work with, you know, to to suit the needs of your um, 
your group. Are you saying that in two or three years, you, you're, you're thinking maybe there would be something else available that we should look at? If that's the case, yes. If, if, if it's five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten 10 years out, uh, we, we need something now. And if we could get it sooner rather than later, the, the sooner the better. Uh, okay. I'm just making sure you're not wed to Porterville Hall if we come up with other options, because that's a main part of our charge here as a committee is to look at all the options, not just kind of look at each, each current functional space, right? We may push the movement of departments around or, or groups around, depending on where we land here as a, as a committee. So I think what I'm hearing is you're not wed to Quarterville Hall being the spot, but that's obviously the most ideal spot given that's where you're at now. And this is what it would take to meet your your space needs. If we could, if we you could come up with something better, we certainly would be short sighted not to not to take a good uh -huh. look at it before we said, "Hey, no, we we love Carterville Hall and its white picket fence." But, uh, <laughs> but uh, uh, of course, we we'd look at it, look at a, a viable option. Okay. Um. I'd also be interested. I'd also be interested in understanding whether, um, given the needs of that particular room that they're looking to add, if that might be money better spent putting a room on the library as a bridge move to doing what you're talking about. No, no. I I, I think what what we we we're a home for the seniors and we're a comfortable place for the seniors and we want to make it uh, more comfortable. One thing I forgot to mention is that in addition to that commons room, there is also a, a program activities room adjacent to, to the uh, commons room, which is uh, uh, connected by a uh, folding wall. So it could be opened or closed depending on what the activities is. And I had forgotten to mention that uh, that room is in there as well. And we do need more activity space for, for uh, small craft sessions or card playing or whatever it happens to be. Or we can open it up if we're having a luncheon and put tables in there because it is adjacent to the to the kitchen. But um, JC, can I add one other thing too? Go ahead, Lisa. Um, just so uh, some members of the committee may not also be aware that that's actually used for a meeting space as well. So a lot of the boards and committees in town actually uh, utilize that. It's utilized for forums. Uh, for different groups that, you know, that have those needs. Um, so it isn't just a senior center. It, it's actually, in a sense, it's a, a little bit more of a community center in, in its capacity now than it may have been envisioned when it originally opened. Um, so that's just another thing to throw in. Thank you. And another you. thing I might mention is if we're spending money on this building, it isn't money, even if we move out into a community center years down the line, that whatever we do to this building right now will be of value for its use in the future, whatever that might be. So it isn't like with, with shot money here, throwing it away. Uh, it still adds value and, and uh, utility to the, to the building. Are there any other questions from the committee for Mr. Harrington? Um, uh, I just, given the number of people in the audience, is there anyone in the audience that has anything specific to Council on Aging that they wanted to raise now? I have to entertain it now, otherwise we're gonna be moving forward on our agenda. All right, uh, John Parent, I'm gonna keep you in as a panelist because we may need you on this next topic on the townhouse, but. Bill, to you and your team, thank you. And we'll certainly be in touch on any next steps, but appreciate kind of the overview of what your, your group is looking for. And Jason, thank you to you and your team. Talk to you later. Thank you. All right, let me... All right, so we are going to move on to agenda item seven, which is townhouse next steps on CPA application. So uh, after we had met last time and took a vote, I sent an email to the Board of Selectmen. They have 
uh, unanimously uh, given us kind of consent to move forward on drafting a CPA application uh, related to the townhouse projects. Uh, in addition, I have not heard specifically from CPC on what their application period will look like, et cetera, but there's definitely some engineering work that needs to be accomplished. And I know John Perrin had already gotten quotes on all that stuff. Um, and, and that engineering work is gonna be required for any successful application. So John, I don't know if you're in a position to just briefly outline what that cost would be. And then what my goal would be is having the committee kind of support um, that recommendation that we can work with Mark and Brian to see if if that if that's sufficient enough to be covered by existing engineering funds, given that there is no um, capital planning committee budget um, available for the foreseeable future until you get to at least July 1st. Sure. Um, in order to do the building envelope study, uh, the estimates I've got, including the architect and the engineering services, uh, fall ballpark of fifteen thousand dollars. If you add in a couple extra meetings and such, I mean, it's a little bit less, but you have to leave a little wiggle room in case you have to have a special meeting or something. So 15,000 should cover us in what we're looking to do here, which should give you a packet similar to what was done up at the library when they were doing their project. And you basically need this to go forward to CPC in order you know, to make your case, to show them that you know this is why we need the funds. The experts have looked at it. They've determined this to be the cost. Um, you know, when you go out to bid and such. Uh, so basically pretty straightforward, but this would be a, a necessary first step. And Mark, Brian, I don't know if you know off the top of your head, otherwise we can take it offline. Um, what the current uh, balances and engineering funds that you do have available and whether this would be an appropriate use. 20,000, Jason? Mark can correct me if I'm wrong. I think it's 20. Yeah, I think, it might, I think it's around 20 or just south of 20. Yeah. And that's sitting in a warrant article? Yes. Yep. Yes. Mm -hmm. Mark, do you have any background just for the benefit of the committee of how that was funded in the past and how it gets replenished? So I can give the history as I know it, and then Brian can chime in. So, so um, uh, this is uh, was previously, I, I think it initially was funded with, a, with an amount smaller than $25,000, but it you know, sustained for probably, I don't know, 10, 12 years before it was spent down. I think what happened was that the um, residents would start asking for um, speed studies and safety studies of their roads, which necessitated bringing in, you know, an engine traffic engineer, and then making um, uh, application to um, to the state to Mass Highway to see if they would approve them, and that started spending the fund down. And then, um, uh, Jason, you'll remember this: uh, the public safety project, <laughs> some of the, some of the feasibility stuff that we had to find money for to get done fairly quickly that depleted the rest of the funds. And so then we went to town meeting and um, reconstituted it with the $25,000. And uh, it's been there for a couple of years, I think at this point, um, and has been touched very little. And Mark, would you, especially given the current economic times we're in, do you think in your opinion, uh, that this is an appropriate use of that fund? Uh, to advance the townhouse projects given how long it's been out there? Or do you think this is something we should just be cautious and, and slow down a bit on, on that specific piece? Well, I, I mean, we've been talking about doing some of these improvements to the townhouse for several years. Um, and, and um, you know, four or five years ago, I think actually maybe five or six years ago, um, we looked at doing the windows, we decided to put them off. And quite honestly, that may have been our sweet spot in terms of affordability. And ever since then, the project seems, seems to just get pushed down the road. I think it would make sense if, if CPC is willing to play ball. I think it makes sense for us to pro probably spend that money now, but that recommendation would need to go to the Board of Selectmen. The board uh, is the one that holds the authorization on spending that. 
So is there any commentary before we make a, a motion to approach the board with that request? Jason, just one thing, and, and, and it just has to do with this whole discussion as, as a whole. CPC was somewhat receptive to entertaining uh, an, an article, but they just didn't know exactly what it entailed and if there was time to get it done. Uh, but they were looking for some direction from the Capital Committee and you know what we were actually looking for. And hopefully we could get an application in relatively quickly. That's it. Yeah, I mean, it sounds like what I'm hearing, Lisa, is we need this engineering study to give them what they're going to need to even take any action. So, would the study be, uh, you know, something we would do before the end of June, or would this be something for fiscal year 21? Hmm. John, how long would it take to do the work if you were to, if you, if you theoretically engage someone today, which obviously you can't do it until at least BOS meets next week? You would not have it before the end of June, I would say, no. It's, it's pretty in-depth work that they do. But you could get started. You're just not going to oh, have absolutely. a report before absolutely, the end of June. Yeah, yeah. But the only question is whether or not we have any budget unders in uh, fiscal year 20 that we could use for it or whether or not we need to put something in 21. Well, I think what we're suggesting here is we fund, assuming the BOS agreed and assuming this committee motions and approval, we'd use the, those funds that are already available in engineering article and we'd use that. Yeah, I'm just thinking the engineering article is a fund, so it carries over year to year, right? Yeah, right. so it's already it's already appropriated. So yeah. it's now up to the board of on how to spend it. Okay. Yeah, I said I'd go forward with that. Any other thoughts? All right, then I will move that uh, we approach the board of selectmen for authorization to spend the engineering fund not to exceed $15,000 for the purposes of drafting an application related to the exterior improvements to the townhouse. Second. There a second. All right, seconded by Lisa. Any further discussion? And when we say improvements to townhouse, we're talking windows or windows and generator? Uh, I said exterior renovations. My thought with that motion was windows and uh, masonry, stonework, et cetera. I don't think generator falls under it, but John can correct me if I'm wrong. Basically, a generator would not fall under that. This would be building envelope. We'd be looking at roof, masonry, sandstone, windows, uh, basically elements that existed in the wind in the building when built. The answer to the question, Kathy. Mm -hmm. All right. Uh, seeing no further discussion, we'll do a roll call vote. Rashi, why? Cook aye. Archive. Omari. F I. Malinowski aye. All right, that carries unanimously. And then, John, we will get you, assuming the board plans to move forward on that, uh, we will work with the CPC to get whatever application they're using so that you and the team can start to try to populate the pieces that we can prior to getting the engineering study. Excellent. All right. Um, and Mark, that doesn't have to go out to any sort of procurement, correct? On that size, before we move off of that item. Uh, it depends on what the what the amount's going to be, but at worst, it's just getting quotes, Jason. Okay. So nothing formal. Got it. Okay. So that sounds a month usually if we had to do that. Uh, all right. So we're going to move on to discussion of Massachusetts Public Library. Construction program. I'm going to move Ryan in. John, do you want to stay in, John, or do you want me to move you out? Uh, you can leave me in or out, whatever works for you. <laughs> uh, I'll leave you in just in case. Okay. <laughs> so, Ryan, welcome. Uh, I do see there are a bunch of other folks from the library as well in the audience. Uh, thank you for the email. Uh, detailing the construction program and where the state thinks they're at. I don't know if you have anything since that email, given it's, I think, two or three weeks old at this point, or anything else you wanted to highlight to the committee on, on how best we can help you move forward despite any of the uncertainties that exist out there in terms of uh, funding, availability, timing, et cetera. 
Uh, good morning, everybody, and thank you to the uh, library trustees that woke up bright and early <laughs> to join me today. Um, I don't think there's a lot that I can add um, to sort of the outline that I sent you. You know, they did outline next steps that we can sort of think about doing, um, which were just to sort of go over them for people that may not have the email handy. Uh, the first is to raise public awareness about any sort of issues in your current facility, especially new services that you're unable to offer due to lack of space or the, they said, inappropriateness of current space, which is a phrase <laughs> I just like. Uh, conduct a prof professional assessment of your current library building for condition, energy use, and functionality. This can be done by construction management firms, architects, and or library building consultants. John and I discussed that point specifically only because a lot of that work has sort of been done. Um, you know, we, we did sort of have an eventful uh, past couple of years with the CPC facade restoration project that we're about to break ground on. Um, but we had to do a lot of assessment work prior to that. And then uh, the flood, <laughs> really, we were very focused on the on the roof for that, but then um, the flood meant that we also had to do some um, in-depth analysis uh, for the building, you know, that John helped us out with. So John really feels like a lot of the assessment work has been completed. It would just be sort of putting that stuff together. Um, and then the third is to start the process of identifying potential sites and or availability of town-owned land. One of the things I think that wasn't in the massive outline I sent you is that part of the initial um, uh, sort of planning and design grant, we, we need to talk about renovating our existing site, but we also need to look at two to three additional sites um, of where a new library would be built. So that is, I did get a list from the assessor's office probably about, I wanna say it was three and a half years ago. So I would probably just need to reach out to them and uh, get an updated list. But I don't know if that's something the Capital Planning Committee, if it's on your radar to sort of look at. Yeah, it, it is, it is Ryan. I think that's probably something we can take off your plate between, we, we had to do it obviously for public safety building um, when we were going through that process and, and Lisa, uh, volunteered at one of our earlier meetings that she obviously has a lot of knowledge of, of some of the parcels too and the, the limitations or advantages to some of them as well. So I think we will likely be able to help identify additional parcels because a lot also depends on what we do with our current parcels, right? In terms of what some of these other departments have told us throughout this process. I am in the process of trying to get um, some example grants, and I think um, Maureen Amyot in Westboro, you know, they recently went through um, the planning and design, and, and they were they were gonna start construction, but now they're not. Um, and Marlboro was sort of in the same boat; they had completed a planning and design, but then they were about to start construction this year, and then they've been deferred now because of the. You know the state of the world. So um, uh, hopefully I can make those available to you guys. I, I know my board was interested in some example grants and I wanted to provide that to them. Um, you know, I know that there has been some discussion in some of, some of the meetings about um, sort of a community center and would the library be part of that? Would the library be not part of that. That's, I think, a much longer discussion potentially. But what I will say is, you know, in prior discussions, the trustees and I have been very interested, obviously, in taking advantage of the construction program. The construction program will only pay for a library portion of any facility. So you, you couldn't apply this sort of to a joint facility. Um, and really, the, I asked about that, and the real reason why they, um, they do that is because um, the Board of Library Commissioners do not like, <laughs> they probably wouldn't phrase it this way, but they do not like the concept of a library being sort of folded into 
uh, other municipal departments. They like libraries to be their own thing. Um, and uh, honestly, yeah. I think there would be a lot of challenges potentially with the library being part of a joint um, community center structure, but I, I'm not opposed to having those conversations. I would just say we'd have to have, we'd have to probably satisfy a lot of, a lot of things. <clears throat> okay. So, so Ryan, the ice, I know there's a huge waiting list and I know your email clearly said they're going to, they may even change the program. Have you seen, not that I'm encouraging we do this, but I, I think it has to be an option on the table. Have you seen communities just build their own library and, and not wait around for the state? Yeah, so I don't, I'm not privy to all the details, but I, I, the construction program, I believe, did exist or was sort of in its infancy when we renovated Southborough. I'm saying we, I, I was, I was a, I was a youngin, I think then, but in the late 80s, um, they, they looked at the construction program. I think at some point, somebody looked at the building envelope and said, you're going to have to do a lot of work. And then there was some sort of override. I've tried to go through the town meeting minutes from then. So I, I believe the renovation that occurred in Southboro, they were aware of the construction program and then proceeded with not taking advantage of it, of going forward with a, um, an addition to the building anyway. So th there are uh, other communities that do that. I will say, when you look at the, um, the sheer amount that you can benefit from this, it's substantial yeah. uh, once construction uh, breaks ground. You know, I, I think that part of my pitch to the town you know, if I think it was similar with the CPC project was that was something where we were able to sort of restore part of the library and we were sort of taking advantage of the fact that that CPC funds were available and that that the Community Preservation Committee supported uh, the project. I think it would be similar to the with the construction program. What I'd like to do is get a lot of community input on the, the design and planning, you know, we probably have to convene a building committee. Um, and then obviously the trustees are gonna be a big part of this as well. Um, but then when we go for the construction pitch, right, to the, to the community, I think sort of the benefit of the construction program is how we sort of draw people in, how we excite them about this and how we say, you know, this isn't, Obviously, there's going to be a cost to this, but the state is going to help out in a very substantial way. And is my understanding correct that you have to, like, they'll fund the engineering a year or two before they're ready to fund the actual construction? Is that, is my interpretation of this correct? I.e., we shouldn't be going out and engineering anything on our own now if we plan to use the, the construction fund. So, so some libraries don't wait for the, the, um, the engineering, the planning and design is what they call it. So they don't necessarily wait for the planning and design grant. They'll do some of that, um, that sort of advanced assessment work uh, to begin with. Um, so, I mean, we, again, we have that option, but that was going back to sort of what I talked to John Parent about, you know, he feels that we're in really good shape as far as how the building's been assessed and he thinks that there's really not that much work to be done there. But uh, John is still on, I think he can correct me if I'm wrong. What do you mean by that, Ryan? What you just said, he had, he, John Parent said, there's not much work to be done. Right, I'm talking the, additional work to the building. At this point, we're putting on a new roof, masonry is being updated. We're looking at a new EMS and boiler system this year. Uh, you've had a major renovation downstairs from the flooding. Next year is scheduled for renovation upstairs. From a perspective of actual physical work to the building, the building's going to be in pretty good shape by the end of next year if everything stays on course. Not, not as in you don't have any work from an engineering perspective. There's still going to have to be professional analysis of the building. And are you saying that because you think that one of the viable choices is to 
renovate, add on to the existing library. And your point is that at least what's there right now is in pretty good shape. So we wouldn't spend more money on that piece of it. No, uh, what I'm saying is from an engineering perspective, they're still going to have to look at it. And what they may determine is that your systems are in generally pretty good shape. Because even if we're looking at a 10 year window uh, before the grant becomes available, you'd be talking your heating system is only 10 years old at that point which, you know, it's just stuff like that. You've got to look at, well, what's the life expectancy of the roof? You know, if we're doing it this year, you only have a 10 year old roof and they will take all this into consideration through a grant process. That's why they're going to do an evaluation of the building before you go into that grant cycle. I don't think we've ever looked at the construction program to sort of fix what's wrong with the library. John and I have always sort of approached the library as you know, we don't know if we're going to ever get this, right? We could apply and not be approved. So, you know, we, John really has to look at maintenance of the building and he's got to sort of plan out where if this wasn't an eventuality and I have to do the same. So this would be, I think looking at our strategic planning efforts, you know, whenever we ask residents what they want from the library, we get a rather extensive list. I, I think <laughs> somewhere in the comments, somebody wanted uh, a gymnasium uh, and us to do gymnastic classes. You know, I think that was something really they should probably be talking to Tim about. But, um, you know, it th that's just the type of feedback we get. There's been a lot of, um, uh, you know, you need a bigger programming area, something with maybe a stage uh, where you could do music or you could do some sort of um, acting performances, right? So we don't have the capacity for that. We don't even have the capacity for, for a children's librarian to host her summer reading programs downstairs. Her space isn't big enough. Um, you know, I think something that happened in the flood when we moved all the books back in, people didn't realize how many books are actually downstairs. It's, it's pretty significant. I think she has something like 35,000 volumes downstairs. That's a lot of books. And if you've ever been in the children's room downstairs, you know that's a tiny space. So we don't want to be removing books from our collection because they don't, we don't have space to put new books in. And we're rapidly approaching that point, you know, so looking at it from a programming perspective for what people want to see and what they want to attend, but also just from a logistic space of where are we going to fit everything that we're, we're getting into the library. I think we need to look at an expansion long term. That's really where we're at with the construction program is that that would, that would be the avenue to look at making a bigger library. Ryan, has anyone ever looked at the existing space in enough detail to at least believe that we do have two choices? We can either build a new library someplace else, or we could expand what we have um, in a meaningful way that would work. Do we do we know that? And that would be really what we would we would look at, Kathy, with the planning and design component. I mean, my focus would be, I have to say, you know, I think as, as you think about these things, you know, I, I, I am sort of invested in the building. I put a lot of time and energy into that. The idea of moving to a new space, I think, gives me some hesitation. I'm not saying that I'm, I'm opposed to that, but I would really, I, I think a big question I've been asked whenever this comes up is if we were to build a new library, where would it go? And I don't think that there's a great answer currently for that. You know, the library kind of has prime real estate right now. And also we just made a big push to, to invest in the historic facade of the library. And Southport Library is literally etched into the stone <laughs> in, the, in the top of the building. So if the library were to move, we'd still have a building right in the middle <laughs> of, of the 30, Route 30 and Route 85 intersection that says Southport Library on it. So, you know, I know Hudson, New Hampshire, they had a historic building. They ended up moving to a new site um, and people still go to the old library all the time because <laughs> they, they think it's still the library. So, you know, I, I, I would like to explore whether or not we can renovate our existing facility. That's, that's my 
that that's what I'd like to do first. I will look at other sites and I, I will um, analyze whether or not we can do a new library because that's part of the process. But, but my, my focus would be on trying to renovate the existing facility and making that work. Well, you know, before Dick Wallace retired, he came to advisory and basically threw out um, keeping the existing library the way it is because of the deed restriction on the land, but then building a second library. Um, I mean, he just threw it out. There was not much discussion about it. So there was that. Um, and then to comment on what someone said a minute ago, the reason some towns build their own library without state funds is because they have people who have donated a lot of money to the library to allow them to do that. And we haven't had that yet, yeah. unfortunately. I, I guess, Ryan, one of the things I saw recently was it looked like in the, um, some of the bond appropriation bills, they were gonna replenish the library fund soon. Now I know that's subject to the governor releasing money, uh, et cetera, but do we foresee a situ situation here in the short term? And I know this is kind of like crystal ball sort of stuff, but were other communities maybe on that list that on that or the 17 communities, but now all of a sudden don't have the funding to move forward because of X, Y, or Z reason related to the pandemic and that they would reopen the list a lot sooner? Or is that just too early to tell? Because it looked like that funding happened after your email that you had sent. So I don't know if it's worth going back to the state or what have you. It's my only concern here, and the reason I raised it is, I think there's going to be unique opportunities for shovel-ready projects here in the next two to, two to five years, um, just based on all the money that's being thrown around by the federal government. And two, uh, I think there's going to be some towns that just don't have the ability to, to deal with some of the stuff, which is going to change how wait lists look, right? I'm not saying we have the ability to deal with it now. Um, I'm just saying I'd like to know kind of what general direction the town's heading and then find the right timing for it. I mean, my focus sort of in the short term is working with John and our operating project manager on getting through the facade restoration project, just because that's going to be substantial construction on the building over the next year. Um, and then really, I, I would say, even though it might be years before the construction program becomes available, is really to start looking at doing some of that work now. And like you said, Kathy, I, I think private fundraising, the, the, the private fundraising needs to be sort of a factor um, to see if, if that is something people would be willing to contribute to. You know, the construction program will pay for a lot of the exterior and maybe bookshelves inside, but it's not going to pay for any furniture. It's not going to pay for a lot of the interior stuff that you would need uh, with a new building. So that's something we need to, we need to look at exploring as well. Um, and that's something I think, you know, the, the Board of Trustees and I will look at. But more than that, I, I think, you know, the makeup of my board is slightly different. I think in the, in the, at the end of the election, I'm going to have three new board members. This is something I need to discuss with the Board of Trustees and then see where they're at. And, and where they want to go. You know, I'm not saying that we couldn't explore short term options, Jason. I just, I don't think we're, I don't think we're there yet, you know? So, Ryan, is the reimbursement from the state the same whether it's a renovation or a new building? Sorry, say that again, Kathy. Is the reimbursement percentage from the state the same whether it's a renovation of an existing building or a new building? That's correct. It's for either. Ryan, can you go back in time and apply for it? If, if we if we find funding in the capital budget, we decide to go forward. Can you can you then go and apply, and and potentially get these funds and use it to offset some of our 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 capital funds that we're using for a new building or renovation, or is it all in advance? You can only apply for it when the application period is open. No, but, but what can I mean you get is, reimbursed? can you, can you get, get reimbursed, reimbursed if, if we decide to go ahead, find, find money in the capital budget without using the construction program and then go ahead and apply for it and get, and get it. Can we, can we use, or would we be eligible I, if we've already started the construction? Oh, Jeffrey, I can answer that question. It is no, 
you right. cannot, um, it needs to be in advance. So you need to apply and then your, your construction timeline needs to adhere to the specified um, grant cycle. So one of the things that happens that would be uh, sort of uh, frustrating maybe is we need to plan a fall town meeting probably just to talk about approving the construction funds because of the way that the state does their grant cycle. So Ryan, I, I assume your intent is to have a library meeting at post-election, you know, in terms of with your new newest members at that point? Uh, yes, we, the, the board is gonna meet, I know on the 5th, and I'm sure we'll talk about this a little bit, but we're not, we were hoping I think to schedule an in-person meeting as soon as possible. And then we're gonna have a new trustee as a result of the election. So, you know, we okay. wanna, my hope was to kind of get everybody together and then just to check in about this and then, you know, see what the will of the board is. I think it would be helpful, at least from my perspective, to understand where the board post whatever the election date is, I should probably know this, but uh, whatever post election date, um, you know, what their view is of the world um, and then um, how they want to proceed. And then I think what this committee needs to think about is um, weighing all land options, not just the existing one, right? And seeing how that jives or doesn't jive with where the library board is headed. And then think about where we put a placeholder for at least what I'll call the space needs study, which I think goes to kind of some of the questions that were thrown out earlier in terms of what you really need and how much extra space is that? Because then that helps you with your your renovate versus new discussion down the road. Just to give you an idea, and I can make this available to you guys, I did ask what um, what the cost was, what the sort of the final number on completed renovated projects were uh, for libraries, and they gave me a list of everything I think that had been completed. It was like the like 16 libraries that, that were finished by 2010. And obviously construction costs change, but sort of the average was, you know, it was between eight to 12 million. And then I think there was one that was like 16 or 17 million that they renovated. That was the big one. But, um, you know, that gave me an idea just about what the cost, the overall cost was. So, you know, I don't and know that's what that's for gonna, renovation. That's for renovated facilities, not for new buildings. I what didn't get that new? data. Oh, you don't have new. Okay. Uh, no, so I'd have to ask. And uh, honestly, the state might be able to provide updated lists for both. So once the project is completed, they do have data on how much the projects cost. And they give an idea based on population size, how big the town was. But obviously, there's you, you guys know this, I think, better than others, is that there's a lot that goes into you know, how much a town wants to invest in a library, right? Tax levy capacity, all of that. So, um, but if you want additional data just on the numbers, I can reach out to them and provide that to you. And the eight to 12 is gross cost, not net cost to us, it's gross. Uh, that's correct. Do you have a copy of the, I think I've seen it, but maybe not, the, the actual deed with the restriction on it for the, the land? Yes, I do, Kathy. I can uh, send that to you and to the rest of um, the committee if they want to see it. I think it'd be interesting at least to read to see if you think there's any wiggle room. And then lastly, as far as the grant cycle for the um, engineering phase, as opposed to the actual construction, are those two grant cycles that the state works independently or do they do a grant cycle for grants for a while and then they do a grant cycle for building? They try to um, pair them so that they're a couple years apart uh, based on the amount of money that they know is gonna become available. Sometimes it has been a turnaround of like a year and a half. So they do planning and design and then they're able to open up construction pretty quick. Um, sometimes it's been a three to four year wait. I wish I could tell you there was consistency in when these grants are offered but what I, they basically offer them when the money is available and they've um, gone through the pending wait list. So 
it's it's infrequent is the best word that I can use. There's no, you can't really, I know you guys are the capital planning committee and you want to plan, <laughs> but the, the problem with this is that I, I've waited six years since I've been here for these grants to open up and they haven't. So I think a, a construction grant was available at some point, um, like not that long after I started, and then there hasn't been a new round since then. So I'm hopeful that it will. We were planning on it opening up, I think in like another three to four years. But again, I don't know what, Jason said he got some data on, um, you know, the governor's appropriation bill that I think obviously the MBLC is advocating for money. There's a lot of people who are on the wait list now, but we'll need to see sort of what the, what the future holds. Yeah, I just I just want to make sure we're ready to apply and have a good sense as opposed to a sense of direction of where, where the library board wants to go when those open. Because I, I realize you never know. Um, and just watching how some of these grant cycles have changed even in other areas outside a library in the last three weeks has been quite amazing to me. Um, like FEMA took some of the match off of some of their grants um, as an example. Um, just been sizable differences because they weren't getting people that were applying. So they took off local matches and stuff like that, just as an example. You know, part of the work that I've really done, and I have to thank John Parent a lot for this, is to enhance our existing facility as much as possible to meet the needs of our users. What is happening six years later is people, people are wanting things that we just can't provide because of space limitations. So I think this is probably the next natural step for us is to look at how we could expand the library or, or make a bigger facility in order to, to meet the needs of our users. Okay. Any other questions for Ryan? Any public comment related to the library? All right, so we're on to uh, next meeting date. Um, thanks, Ryan. Thank you, guys. So in terms of uh, next meeting date, uh, I didn't have one in mind. Again, I think we need to kind of um, take a look at where we're at. Um, and hear from the schools at some point, but again, I'm not pushing that conversation until they get beyond graduation, end of school. Um, they've just acknowledged receipt of the message. That's pretty much the only conversation there's been. So um, I'm not in an immediate rush to do that, but at the same time, I don't want to lose our momentum. So I didn't know uh, if we want to go two weeks out, three weeks out. Um, that's kind of what I was wrestling with. Can I make one suggestion? Um, it's your call, Jason, but um, you're going to see an email that Mark Purple has sent out at 7.57. Um, so there is quite a debate on whether there's going to be a town meeting. Um, the Board of Health apparently um, does not want an indoor town meeting on June 13th. So it's being discussed. Um, but if we're going to have a meeting on June 13th, the two there's three people on this committee that have a lot to do between now and June 13th. Um, That's what I was, yeah. You ready? So I prefer the next meeting to be after June 13th, even if we don't, even if we postpone the town meeting. Let's if we could just wait after June 13th, so we can get the That's rest fine. of the work done. That would be helpful to at least three. And people. also, Jason, if I can add um, as well, town elections are the 16th. So between town meeting and town elections, it would. For me, anyway, I mean, the committee doesn't have to wait for me, but uh, it would be easier for me to, uh, and that's if I get reelected, uh, there may be somebody else sitting here anyway. So um, yeah, if we could do it sometime after, obviously after the 16th for me. How about the, how about we look at the 22nd? That's fine for me. Is there any objection to the 22nd? All right, uh, morning or evening? I'm flexible. Joe, any, 
any thoughts? I know you had had some conflicts in the morning. Whatever everybody wants, I'm good. All right. I, I'm I go. prefer evening, but I'm not wedded to it. I just have a standing meeting that I got to change if I do that. All right. Well, let me, I'm just, I'm in the public meeting room availability now. Um, it's booked at the evening that day, but not the morning. All right. Morning's fine then. And Kathy, you mean it's at 8.30? Because I'm thinking the next meeting's not that long. Yeah, but I can, I'll push it to 9.30 just to be safe. I'm fine. Okay. All right. So let's plan the 22nd at 7.30. Um, any public comment? Seeing none, the only other item under other business, uh, I actually have two things, I'll make them really quick. Uh, one is assuming town meeting goes on in the middle of June, uh, there's been a lot of discussion about the hook lift truck. We voted to have that in the spring. Um, however, because it wasn't on the actual warrant and the potential for bonding associated with it, it will not be, if we do meet in June 13th as a town, it will not be there. It'll have to be a fall item, which I think is unfortunate given the timing. Um, but I would hope that if there is no town meeting June 13th um, and somehow there's an, a special that they move it up earlier in the fall, um, not wait till October. Um, because there's obviously be a lot of postponed business and hopefully we'll slip it in there uh, for discussion and, and a vote then, but it will not be on the spring um, town meeting floor. And I think that was a decision, Mark, correct me if I'm wrong, by the moderator uh, based on how the warrant was printed. No, you're correct, Jason. Okay. So, and then Kathy, I know your committee had some follow-up questions on the uh, fire <laughs> stuff. Yeah, so it, was kind of, it, was, it was kind of embarrassing. It was late, just so you know, it was late. We had a long yeah. meeting. And so um, me, Andrew didn't remember as either. It was both of us. Can you go back over why? The question was, there was still a question on why the fire chief needs a new vehicle, not police, but fire. And so I kind of mumbled something and I said, I'll get back to you. <laughs> I kind of forget what all, I said, we got rid of the second one. They're able to, so, and then I just stopped. I said, I'll get a more coherent so, explanation as to why we concluded that the chief's um, request is viable and warranted. So we postponed fire chief's vehicle till at least the fall, but I think there was some discussion that it could be up to three to four years based on where some of the committee members are at. We didn't take a position that we just said we would revisit for the fall. And the main reason we postponed it was because there is a functioning chief's vehicle now that's able to do everything a chief fire chief needs to do on scene. The, this request would have been to give a backup vehicle to that, either for a second in command, uh, like an on-call officer, or the chief when this vehicle is out of service for any means, because the Explorer that former Chief Morrow used to drive was not set up to adequately run a, a fire scene. Okay, so just uh, to be clear, Jason, right now on the um, budget capital, um, in the budget capital, there is the chief vehicle, which they're calling C20, $60,000. So that's, that's in the there fall. right now. Well, okay, it, it may be, you may think it's the fall. It's not on the fall right now as far as our workbook that we work with. So we think, so you're saying it's the fall. Yes. So I don't know what workbook it is, but if you or Mark want to, or Brian want to share it, with me just to make sure, but we voted it on the fall and it was a unanimous vote for reconsideration. Okay, so the only thing we've got on the fall, just so you know, with the workbook that we all work with, advisory and the town, it's it only thing he says is the hook truck um, for a fall bond. And, and why can't we have that at the springtime meeting? I mean, we're gonna have to do a on the floor motion to append the warrant and amend it with all the changes anyway. It's gonna exceed the total amount of what was originally there, and that was the concern. If you look at, if you don't look at the sum, if you just look at the sum of the parts, not look at what each of the individual parts were, the concern was that the the sum was greater than what had originally been forecasted to the taxpayers. But Even the, though there's all these other operational things that are going down, yeah, it, it's two different articles. I think okay. that's where the concern was. I think it's more of a bonding issue um, because you have to vote separately for. No, Jason, I asked, no, even Jason, if we didn't no, bond Jason, it. Right, Kathy. 
Say, yeah, again, I, say it again, Mark. I'm sorry, uh, Jason's right. It's not a bonding issue. We have a separate article for bonding requests for capital, but because the only uh, the only item there was the uh, was the fire pumper for six hundred thousand, adding you know another couple hundred thousand dollars for a vehicle exceeds the total value of the article, and the moderator you know didn't agree that that article could be modified in that fashion. But you're still talking about the bonding article, or not? Correct. That's. Okay. That's the only place it really could have gone. Okay. So unless, because that says unless 600. Unless we moved it to operation budget, which we don't necessarily want to do. Okay. Yeah, I don't think we've got $200,000 of capacity yeah. <laughs> or you know, $165,000 of capacity to be able to pay it in cash. Yeah, okay. okay. So the bonding article says 600 and doesn't Correct. say 600 plus whatever the, the 165. Okay. Correct. So, so Kathy, if and I'm happy to join whenever you guys end up meeting this week. I'm happy to join the first five minutes. That would be easier if any of your committees may follow up on the fires. That would be great. Yeah. We'll, we'll, you can go first. Um, okay. Get on, get on yeah. off and just. So, all right. And then the other item I had under other business, it's, it's an easy item, uh, but Lisa kind of just alluded to it, um, is um, actually all of our appointments end on 6.30 of 2020. Um, so, the BOS needs to meet to reappoint us. We actually were not on the list last week um, of, of scheduled reappointments. Um, it was just canly because we're so new. Um, so I just, they typically send a letter out asking if you want to be reappointed, et cetera. Um, I offered to Mark, I would just survey us in this format. Um, is there anyone that does not want to be reappointed for next year? that was an easier way of doing it so jason um, jason just one thing so i, I actually been uh, going back and forth with Lori this morning the reason it didn't come up is because um the um when you were appointed in march um the clerk's office had it as your appointment runs until three nine of 2021 so um we just have to Lori's going to work with jim just to line that back up with all our other annual appointments so okay. that'll that'll be on the agenda for the uh, for the next meeting for the selectman next week. Okay. So Brian Valentine is on here. Brian, do you did you hear what Jason said that the chief's vehicle is for the fall? Because that's not what's on our workbook here. Yeah, I have a tab that says spring and fall. It's always been on the fall or mine, but maybe you didn't get that. But well, is, I, right? did, I didn't look at that one. I, I'm looking just because yeah. you've got fall next to the hook truck. So I just going to be quick calling it. So, okay, you're right. Yeah, you're yeah. So minor, minor miscommunication. But yes, I get that. Okay, I get it. Okay. Any other business? All right, I'll make a motion to adjourn. Is there a second? Second. All those in favor, roll call. Rashio I. Cook I. Park I. Palmer I. Faf I. Malinowski I. Have a great day, everyone. Take, Take care. Take care. Take care.